It's the 1st of May and I'm Tom Glasson. Welcome to The Roast. Now, with the release of the Commission of Audit, I thought I might have a look and see exactly what recommendations they have made. You know, I've rethought about it. I might just skip to the end and find out who dies. <gasps> ruin it for you, but if you're sitting anywhere near your National Preventative Health Agency right now, give it a hug and say, everything's gonna be okay. Also tonight, the New South Wales Young Liberals think they're Fight Club, but they're not Fight Club. First though, Mark Humphreys has the headlines. The Liberal Party is offering the chance to attend a breakfast with the Prime Minister for $11,000. At that price, it had better be available after 10.30. Liberal Party Federal Director Brian Lochnane, seen here revealing his plot for world domination, sent an email offering the breakfast to business observers. If you're not sure whether you're a business observer, just check whether your last breakfast bill was $11 or $11,000. Also, the $11,000 price tag is significant because it's just below the $12,000 threshold at which political donations have to be disclosed to the Australian an electoral commission and it's good that they won't have to disclose who donates because if the current corruption inquiries have taught us anything it's that confidential meetings between politicians and businessmen always end well the labor party has announced plans to launch its own news service i've got their first headline labor party announces terrible idea national secretary george wright says party members have requested the service due to media bias you've told us that you can see the labor message isn't making it through the mainstream media not making it through oh i've got labor's message right here uh oh Oh, I forgot, they don't have a message. But don't worry, everything's going to change for the ALP once they have their very own news service. So how big is it going to be? The party is hoping to hire a journalist on a salary of about $95,000 to create a news service. Jeez, a news service with one journalist. That'd be a hell of a newsroom. Humphreys, I need a thousand words bashing that Liberal Party breakfast and I need it by the time I finish this sentence. You got it, Chief. Yeah, this is a great story. For the Liberal Party news service, you're a disgrace, Humphreys. I know, Chief. Good job, everyone. That was our best issue yet. But digital media revenue is hard to come by, so Humphreys, you're fired! I'm gonna miss you, Chief! Boss of Australia Tony Abbott has decided to lower the threshold for his paid parental leave scheme, meaning some Australian couples may reevaluate their baby plans. Honey, we're gonna have to stick with the baby born. Abbott announced the wage threshold will be reduced from $150,000 to $100,000 on Wednesday, having seemingly forgotten what he said on Tuesday. We are not gonna be a government which promises things before the election and walks away from them afterwards. That's right, they're not going to be a government which walks away from pre-election promises. They are a government which walks away from pre-election promises. The scheme had been described as Abbott's signature policy, but now it's been watered down, Abbott will need a new signature policy, which I'm hoping will be a policy to get a new signature. I mean, what the hell is this? Looks like our Prime Minister is called Tim G. For the roast, I'm Mark Humphreys. Thank you, Mark. Well, first up, the Commission of Audit, tasked with helping the government become more efficient, was released today 12 days before the May budget, which gives it, at best, 12 days on the top of the charts. Inside are 86 red-hot recommendations, some of which would be implemented immediately, others would need further consideration, while some would be rejected outright. So the government is your mother when you suggest she starts using internet banking. Oh yeah, it sounds great, darling. I'll, um, I'll think about it. Now, at the time of filming, we didn't have a chance to look at the Commission of Audit, but sources say a lot of the recommendations would lead to state governments having more responsibility. And that's good for states that are being run really well right now, like... I don't know, the state of origin? That always seems to rate well. But seeing as there are so many New South Wales government officials currently fronting the Independent Commission Against Corruption, I think we can agree there are some people whose hands you wouldn't want to be left alone in. OK, boys, now remember, he's in charge because he's the eldest, so look after each other, and no running in the house. Yes, Mum. All right, you little wanker. Unless you want a knuckle sandwich for dinner, you're going to go do my homework, give me all your tazos, and go and make me a big bowl of ice cream. Ah, oh, and if Mum asks, you ate the ice cream. Jesus, New South Wales is mean. The report also recommends we move away from the Rudd era idea of cooperative federalism and move towards competitive federalism so that the states and territories will compete with each other to provide the best services at the lowest cost. And that's what our fathers of federation envisaged when they created this Commonwealth of Australia, that all states, territories and whatever the hell Norfolk Island is would come together, stand side by side and start hocking their cheap wares like they were in a third world bazaar 
and we're in the market for some cheap knockoff health insurance. And even if some of these recommendations are implemented and the states start having more control over things like health and education, it's going to be interesting to see what each region's priorities are and getting access to the best services might be a bit harder. OK, we need to get you to school by 9 o'clock in Victoria and then Davey has a doctor's appointment at 11 o'clock in Queensland. And why is that, Davey? Because we don't run in the house. Ah! I finally get it! That's why Abbott's obsessed with building roads will be driving everywhere all the time. And since the authors of this commission of audits are an independent body, well, let's find out who they are. Alex Lee investigates. The independent body that has released the Commission of Audit is headed by Tony Shepherd. He's the former president of the Business Council of Australia, advocate for big business and author of best-selling book How to Succeed in Business Without Having Teeth. But is Tony Shepherd qualified to cut down the nation's debt? As chairman of construction company Transfield, he presided over hundreds of millions of dollars of losses on poorly designed purchases. But like an addict who convinces their partner to take them back, Shepard promises it's going to be different this time. He also heads up the body overseeing the construction of the $11 billion motorway co-funded by the Abbott government. So I'm sure he'll think long and hard before deciding not to cut roads funding. Joining Tony Shepard is Amanda Vanstone, a former Howard government minister and living proof that dogs do not always look like their owners. At least until they grow up. And Peter Boxall also joins the team. He's formerly Peter Costello's Chief of Staff. So two of the five commissioners have either worked for the Liberal Party or represented the Liberal Party. And the head is the former president of the Business Council of Australia, a council known for its independence. The Commission of Audit. Independent, depending how close you look. Thank you, Alex. You know, with all the party dissent in the Liberal caucus, it sounds like Tony Abbott should hang out at the Commission of Audit because he'd probably get a friendlier reception there. We'll be right back. All right, gang, it's time to jump online and answer tonight's question. Have you ever had an independent body? How independent was your body? Was it a problem or did you like it? We'd love to hear about it at the Roast TV or hashtag Roast TV. Finally tonight, young Liberal Aaron Henry, seen here playing pretty fast and loose with the term young, has been identified as the brains behind a Fight Club-inspired covert mission codenamed Black Ops. <laughs> what were these Black Ops? Domestic surveillance? Assassination? Kidnapping Bob Catter's hat? Their mission? To tear down illegally posted campaign posters on telegraph poles. And by illegal, they mean Labor campaign posters. Hi, David Fincher. The plot for Fight Club 2? I think we just found it. Oh, I forgot to tell him my name. Oh, and my number. Oh, and the plot. Well, that's OK, because Mr Henry, who just watched Fight Club for the 28th time, helpfully outlined his ideas in an email, demonstrating his superior knowledge of the film by appropriating classic Fight Club rules to apply to covertly slashing posters, like, first rule of black ops is you don't talk about black ops, black shirts and black shoes, and if this is your first night at black ops, you have to slash. No, it's good. I see what you did. Oh my god, can we stop it with the Fight Club references already? Hey, young libs, first rule of being a fan of Fight Club, stop over-referencing the rules of Fight Club. Second rule of being a fan of Fight Club, shut the f*** up! Oh, but Nick, he's such a fan of the movie. He even signed off his email as Tyler Durden. Oh, he signed off as Fight Club character Tyler Durden? Yeah, that's cute. So Mr Henry is saying he's a figment of a sick loser's delusional imagination? Or maybe he missed that crucial plot twist. It really is something you only pick up on the 29th viewing of the film. Or the first. He probably also turned off before the third act of Fight Club, where it says nighttime anarchy doesn't work, the main character tries to shoot himself in the face, and the film concludes that being in Fight Club is both shit and a stupid way to take down the establishment. The establishment that you, the young liberal party, one day hope to be in control of. You radical idealists. Stop talking about Fight Club. Do I need to remind you of the first rule of Fight Club? Thank you very much, Nick. No, I don't, because you've seen it 28 times. Thank you again. And you see, the problem is, from little things like young politicians, big things grow, like big politicians. And if this is the way our future leaders conduct themselves, well, just when we're... Can we expect any better when they're older? 
Absolutely not, Tom. Young politicians aren't caterpillars. They're not going to shed their foolish student politician skin and emerge from a university cocoon as a mature human being. Young politicians are more like the Muppet Babies. In that they're constantly being ordered around by a giant woman's legs. No, in that they're young versions of the more powerful adult franchise, but with exactly the same personalities. Take the LNP, for example. If, as a university student, you have all the charm and wit of an empty pond, you might think an aside seeker themed pub crawl is amusing. Chances are then that as a big grown-up politician you might think a Gillard themed genitalia obsessed menu might be funny. These kinds of politicians don't really grow up, they just keep doing the same immature shit but somehow end up responsible for the entire country, like baby pharaohs. But given that these student politicians will probably one day be in power, it's a good idea to get them used to the inevitable childish insults they'll face early. That's why I've made this menu. All oh, right, what do we got? Young politician casserole. A bunch of tasteless assholes. Oh, no, thank you. I don't want that. Yeah, no one does. Is there a dessert menu I could look at? No. No, I've missed the point entirely? Yeah, well, maybe if I uh, read it 28 more times, I'll miss the point once again. Uh, good night.